to serve, then they might say, well, hey, that's why I'm here. You can serve me, you know? Parents, you ever feel like that with your kids? <laughs> Jesus has just experienced an absolutely grueling day in ministry. Let's kind of walk back through what that first day of his ministry was like. Mark records it for us. He goes to the synagogue at Capernaum. He engages in a teaching ministry. Mark includes the detail in a very kind of terse way, but it was an impactful day. Right after he teaches, there just happens to be a demon in the synagogue. He casts the demon out, exhausting. He goes home to lunch at Peter's house, and what does he find at Peter's house? Peter's mother-in-law is ill. He heals her. She begins to serve them. And word spreads about this. This man, Jesus, not only is he a great teacher, but at the same time, he is a man with power to heal. And as word spreads, crowds come to Peter's home. And they go up to the front door of Peter's house, and they're waiting on Jesus to do a miracle for them. And Jesus heals many there. Jesus was the constant giver. His friends, the crowd, they have no idea the amount of both physical and spiritual energy that it takes to preach and to heal. And we know many doctors and nurses that have been through the COVID-19 pandemic who would describe their experience after days and months of helping other people. They would put this label on that experience. I am experiencing right now, and you might be able to fill in this blank, compassion, what? Fatigue, yeah. No one knew what that was until COVID-19 came out, and then all of a sudden now it's compassion, fatigue. Perhaps you're there right now. It could be a situation at work that drives you to the point of exhaustion. Employees that will not show up for work. A boss that doesn't seem to care about anyone but himself or herself. A client, maybe, who believes that they're your only client, and you should take care of all their needs instantly. A manager, maybe, who can't seem to manage without your constant oversight. Maybe it's a bleak economic outlook where products are hard to come by and even harder to sell because the price keeps going up and up and up. Others experience compassion fatigue in their families. Maybe um, it's a non-believing spouse who's me-centered instead of Christ-centered, and you feel it every day. Maybe it's a wayward child that's addicted to substances, or perhaps it's a school system that's godless, but at the same time, you don't feel like you have other options to help and educate your children. Maybe it's a disease or a sickness that randomly attacks. You feel powerless, held captive to worry. When's the next time? What's the next thing? Maybe it's a lack of godly friends to influence your children or your grandchildren. Are you exhausted today? Let me ask one more question. If you are, what will recharge your spiritual batteries for another long day on the job or another emotionally depleting family encounter. You see, what we're looking at today, I believe, are eminently practical issues. And in the person of Christ, we will find both an example and a reservoir to meet our spiritual needs. Now, here's the point of our text. Let's try to make it really simple. Prayer connects us to the infinite reservoir, or infinite resources of our God, in order that we might be faithful to our calling. Now, we're going to look at two headings as we focus on that main point. We're going to look at verses 35 through 37. Jesus focuses on private prayer. And secondly, we're going to look at his preaching ministry. Jesus' private prayer life empowers him to preach. Let's read verses 35 through 37 again. God's Word. And rising very early in the morning, 
While it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place. And there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him. And they found him and said to him, Everyone is looking for you. You see, great seasons of activity in ministry call for even greater seasons of prayer. It's vitally important that we carve out time out of our schedule to take care of our souls. Now, I hope you know that what I'm preaching to you about today, I'm also preaching to myself about as well. You see, I used to be really enamored with great missionary biographies, and I found a pattern among several biographies that I read. I read about the life of Jim Elliott, if you've ever heard of Jim Elliott. Died at the age of 29. He was martyred by the Aka Indians. I read about David Brainerd. Died as well at the age of 29. His ministry to the Indians of upstate New York, 1700s. I read as well about the Reverend Robert Murray McShane, who died also at the age of, can you guess it, 29. And I used to think that there was something magical about that, that these men were so devoted to their God that God took them away at a young age. And I thought, man, what a way to go. However, later I read part of a letter that, David, or that uh, Robert Murray McShane wrote to one of his friends. He confessed to his friends, he said this, God gave me a message to deliver the gospel and a horse to ride his body. And then he confessed this, alas, I have killed the horse and now I cannot deliver the message. What he's saying is that if he would have paced himself differently, he could have preached many, many more sermons. But he used up his life, burned the candle at both ends. Jesus' patterns in his life, I believe, are instructive for us. If we are to run our race faithfully, if we are to grab a hold of God for the entirety of our life, we have to know, how are we going to run this race? Jesus, I think, gives us a great pattern today. We see him very intentionally at specific moments in his ministry, going alone, communing with his Father, so that he might be ready to go back into the battlefield of ministry. Prayer for Jesus was the ammunition in order that he might be able to preach. Notice in verse 35 that it says that Jesus goes out very early in the morning while it's still dark. Now we might ask, why does he do that? Why does he go out early in the morning? Is there something magical about the early morning hours that are different than any other hour of the day? We might say, maybe, maybe not. You see, Jesus' popularity was rising. He was performing miracles. He was teaching in ways that had great authority that they had never heard anything like this. And crowds were clamoring to get a piece of of Jesus. Perhaps he chose the early morning hours because everyone else was in bed asleep at that time. It was the only time of the day where he could get away and where he could be alone. Now let me ask you for just a moment. If you had to identify a time of day in your life right now, your schedule, that you could carve out where you could be absolutely alone with God, what time frame would that be? 6 a.m. to 7 a.m., 8 to 9, noon to 1. What is it? Whatever that time frame is, I would encourage you, lock onto that, guard it, and use that moment wisely. Jesus is giving the first part of his day to prayer. Giving the Lord the first part of your day I think is a really good idea. For me, it's the most fruitful part of the day that I have. I'm a morning person. You might not be. But for me, from 6 a.m. to 1 p.m., I can get a lot of things done from 6 to 1. Now, we get into the afternoon hours, 1 o'clock on, and I am completely and utterly 
worthless. There's no amount of caffeine that's going to, you know, boost me up to get something creative done. I just, the mornings are the best times. For you, that might be different, but you've got to find that time in your life, in your day, where you can focus on God. Now, notice as well that Jesus goes into the wilderness. The wilderness. We've already seen this term wilderness come up in Mark's gospel. Jesus was tested in the wilderness by the devil. Remember that? The wilderness was a place in the Old Testament that was very important. It was a place of spiritual restoration. It was a place of redemption. It was a place of repentance, renewal, and for Israel, testing. Jesus has already been tested in the wilderness. And now he goes to the wilderness for all of those other reasons. Restoration, redemption, repentance, renewal. How many of you love going to the mountains? Yeah, especially in the summer, right? It'd be great to get out of the 110 degree heat that is Amarillo, Texas and get up in the mountains where it's nice and cool. I love going to the mountains for multiple reasons. Not just because I enjoy fly fishing. I also love it because my cell phone doesn't work. Isn't that a blessing? You get away from everything and nobody can contact you. It goes straight to voicemail. Now, the bummer is when you come out of the wilderness, you know, your cell phone, ding, 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 and you get all these messages that, that, that uh, come through. Wilderness is important for us. I think it's also important for our kids. When I was growing up, church camp was my favorite week of the year. We'd go to the mountains. Now, we didn't have cell phones then, but we had other activities. We'd leave all those things behind. We'd focus on God for one week in the wilderness, and it was fantastic. I think there's a great value for that in the life of our students. Getting away, getting off of screens, whatever screen it is, and just focusing on God. Now, our entire life is not lived in those wilderness moments, and you know that. The purpose of the solitary place is to revive us. It's to prepare us for the next season. God did not create the wilderness so that we could become hermits. He created it to recharge us and then send us back into the fight. The solitary place will play a key role in Jesus' ministry. Mark's gospel, Jesus will go to this place three times. Here... The next time that he goes to the wilderness is after he feeds 5,000 people. Again, think about that. What would it be like to preach to 5,000 and then also, hey, you're in charge of dinner. Make it happen now. The third and final time that Jesus will go to the wilderness in Mark's gospel is in the Garden of Gethsemane. And there he will wrestle with his father in prayer as he looks at the final leg of the race of redemption. Have you been to the solitary place recently? If you've been there, did you invest the time that you had in prayer? Now, by God's grace, sometimes we find ourselves in the solitary place when we weren't expecting it. How many of you have been to a doctor's office to get, quote, established recently? You go there thinking, oh, it's like 30 minutes, and you're there half a day. What are you going to do with all that time? Well, you could pray. You could consider, man, this is a blessing, God. I, I wasn't counting on this extra couple of hours. Let me focus on you. Students, yearly you have to take an exam if you're in public schools. We all know about it called the STAR test. Teachers, you know about it as well. It's a test that uh, they're going to block out half a day for, but really probably takes about 30 minutes to an hour, right? So what do you do with the rest of that time? My kids tell me when they come home, I'm so bored. Star test day. So boring. Start. Well, think about that. You have, unex- well, I guess if you've done the star test once or twice, you, you, you know what's coming. So you've got time on your hands. That is an incredible blessing. It could be an emergency that leaves you on the side of the road waiting for hours for help to arrive. 
Again, I would say, man, that, that's, that is an unexpected blessing. Make the most of it. When you find yourself in those solitary moments, do you complain? Do you grumble? Do you worry about it? How am I going to get out of this? You know, what is the diagnosis going to be? What am I going to do? Do you daydream? Do you pray? Not only where Jesus goes, but what he does in the wilderness is important. Jesus focuses on prayer. Now, the content is not recorded. We're just told in verse 35 that he prayed. Jesus' entire life was focused on communing with his Father. Now, he had a relationship with God at a level that I would argue cannot be experienced by anyone else. Jesus is God and man at the same time. The thought processes of the Son of God are in constant communion with God the Father. He is infinite God and man at the same time. Now, we can't have that level of relationship with God. But we can have a very intimate relationship with the Lord. Now, there are those times in our lives where the Holy Spirit pushes us and compels us to pray. Have you experienced that? We could, could, we could call it an impulse of prayer. When these impulses come, we, we might be reading our Bible or we might be thinking about the members of our family, the members of our church, our missionaries, and that impulse comes, pray for them and pray right now. God's Holy Spirit puts that movement on our heart for a purpose. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, my favorite preacher who has already died, he writes this, never resist, never postpone it, prayer. Never push it aside because you're busy. Give yourself to prayer. Yield to it. And you will find that you have not been wasting your time with respect to the matter with which you are dealing but that actually prayer has helped you in this respect and that greatly. Friends, prayer is powerful. You believe that? The prayers of the saints is one of the primary means that God uses to accomplish His purpose in this world. Ajith Fernando tells a story of John G. Patton, who was a missionary to the New Hybrids Islands. The story goes like this. Hostile natives surrounded John Patton's missionary headquarters, intent on burning it to the ground and killing him and his wife. John and his wife prayed all through that terror-filled night, asking God to deliver them. When daylight came, they were surprised to see that all of the attackers had left. A year later, the chief of the tribe was converted to Christ, and Patton had an opportunity to ask him what kept them from burning the house down and killing them. The chief replied, who were all those men that were with you that night? Patton said, you're mistaken. There were no men there, only my wife and I. But the chief said that he had seen hundreds of big men in shining garments drawn swords in their hands. They seemed to circle the mission station, so tribesmen were afraid to go anywhere near it. And Patton had realized that God had sent his angels to protect them that night. What do you do when prayer is either not natural or it's difficult to engage in? Let me give you a tip. It was given to me by another theologian. Sometimes you have to prime the prayer pump. Gentlemen, have you tried to start a weed eater that has been setting for a while? You don't just pull the cord and the engine runs. You've got to prime it, right? And choke the engine, and all of a sudden it kind of... And then it fires up and goes. White smoke blows out and everything else. Sometimes our prayer life is like that. We've got to prime the prayer pump. How do we do that? Well... Two of the best resources that I've found, number one, the Bible. You read Scripture every day, God's Word is going to prompt you to pray. Another resource that I've found that has been exceedingly helpful 
is a book of prayers written by other believers. It's called the Valley of Vision. You've heard me mention it before. These, these are Puritan prayers categorized by topic. I try to read one of those prayers every day because I believe that I can learn a lot from the Puritans. And those prayers have been very helpful to me. Friends, praying characterizes the life of faith. So if you're not a man or woman, boy or girl of prayer, then you need to be concerned about the relationship that you think that you have with God. J.C. Ryle, 19th century pastor, writes this, What shall we say to, they, to those who never pray at all in the face of such a passage as this? There are many, such it may be feared, in the list of baptized people who rise up in the morning without prayer and without prayer lie down at night. Many who never speak one word to God are they Christians? It's impossible to say so. A praying master like Jesus can have no prayerless servants. The spirit of adoption will always make a man call upon God. To be prayerless is to be Christless, godless, and in the high road to destruction. What a warning. Friends, we need to be warned like this. Because so often, our agenda and God's agenda are two totally different things, are they not? Now, I believe we're going to find that in verses 36 and 37. God's agenda and man's agenda are conflicting. Let's look at verses 36 and 37. Simon and those who were with him searched for him. Now, I would translate it like this. They tracked him down. The verb search here is used for hostile purposes. I mean, think about when do you track someone or something down? Have you ever been on a mountain lion hunt? It's fantastic. You go out with dogs. Typically, you ride a horse or a mule. You're in the saddle all day long. The dogs are working, and what are they doing? They're tracking down a lion. If you ever watched on TV, we're going to track down a fugitive, and how do they do that? They release the dogs, you know, and the bloodhounds find the fugitive. When you track someone down, you have a hostile intent on your mind. This is what is on the mind of Peter. Now, when he finds Jesus, verse 37, look at what he says to him. Everyone's looking for you. Why are they seeking Jesus? Why is everyone seeking Jesus? Probably because he's done miracles. And everyone wants him to do a miracle for them. Jesus didn't come to the earth to be a wonder worker. That's not his primary mission. He has come to confront men and women with the kingdom of God. He has come to offer them eternal life. Now the good news is these disciples are a work in progress and we find in Mark's gospel that they're just maybe one step ahead of the crowd most of the time. Christ will ultimately transform them. He'll do that by the power of his resurrection. But until that time comes, their attention needs to be redirected back onto the work of God. You see, things are heating up in Capernaum a bit too quickly. Jesus will tell Peter in verses 38 and 39, look, the purpose for which I have come is not to, to do a bunch of healings. I've come to preach not necessarily to heal. This gives us our second movement in this sermon. Jesus' ministry is about public preaching. Verses 38 and 39. He said to them, Let us go to the next towns that I may preach there also, for that is why I came. And he went throughout all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. Nobody can tell Jesus where to go or how to conduct his ministry. He will leave Capernaum at this point in order to preach to all the towns of Galilee. The Son of Man has come from heaven to earth. Why? To give a message 
to the people of God. You see, there will always be felt needs that we will have on the side of glory. There will always be pains. There will always be heartaches that we have now. Jesus doesn't come principally to help us with these felt needs. He comes to push us to that ultimate goal. New creation, new resurrection, new heavens, and a new earth. God has made all of us to be two substances at the same time, body and soul. This is known as a dichotomy, two substances. The Son of Man is going to focus on both. But often the body, the flesh, Jesus will put off the full restoration of that to the new heavens and the new earth. In other words, his primary focus is going to be on our soul, our spirit. I was challenged this week by a friend who's a pastor. Every once in a while, we'll send texts to each other and, you know, kind of challenging texts to, to do something or pray for some person or some event or whatever it is. This text came through and he said, hey, I want you to help me drill water wells in India. He told me the organization that it was with, World Vision. I replied back, man, I, I, I used to fund World Vision as well. And he said, I did so until they embraced the uh, sexual revolution agenda. I said, I don't give a dime to World Vision anymore. Because they stopped preaching the gospel and they started focusing on just felt needs alone. I said, I, I wish you all the best in this, but I would encourage you to redirect your attention to gospel proclamation, not just worldly philanthropy. Jesus came to preach. Preaching is powerful. Preaching is effective. Preaching is mysterious. You see, God ordains that He will save men and women through a spoken message. When the Word of God is preached, God's Spirit works in the human heart. And He changes you. Paul speaks of the power of preaching in Romans 10, verses 13 through 15. Andrew alluded to it today. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on Him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in Him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Now Paul is going to go on to charge Timothy about the value of preaching 2 Timothy 4, verses 1 through 2, and he's going to tell them, this is the central component of your ministry. Paul, to young Timothy, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom. Do you hear, do you hear how weighty that is? He's looking at the triune God, the fact that the judgment is coming. And then he tells them this. Preach the word. Be ready in season and, and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. God's kingdom is mysteriously advancing in this world by God's means. And the means that he has ordained is the preaching of the gospel. The world might prefer Jesus to be a wonder worker, a worker of miracles, that Jesus chooses to accomplish his mission very differently. He chooses to use a spoken message that will change the human heart. Jesus is now preaching in the synagogues in Galilee. His preaching and his teaching mission is accompanied by works of power. Friends, when the gospel is preached, there's a confrontation that happens. It will either find a warm place in our heart, a receptive place, or it will find opposition. And in both situations, the gospel works. Now, I believe Jesus is focused on the synagogue here because 
The gospel, the good news, comes first to the Jew, then to the Gentile in the history of salvation. As we wrap things up today, I want to ask you a question. Are you tired today? Have you been burning the candle at both ends? Are you in need of a spiritual recharge? Where will that recharge come from? Perhaps you don't feel the burden of evangelism and the antidote of sin found in the gospel. What's going to empower you to grab a hold of God to share His liberating grace to others? Friends, learn from Christ today. Learn from His example. Derive your strength from His reservoir. Prayer in the secret place in the dark hours connects us to the resources of our God in order that we might be faithful to share the gospel to others. Please stand. Let's sing.